Greetings and welcome back to the final section, section F of lecture one. In this section, we're going to briefly discuss something we'll discuss in greater detail throughout the rest of the course. And this is a revisit of the idea of samples versus populations. And we're going to talk about the idea of the sample distribution versus the underlying population distribution. Generally in research, samples are taken from a larger population. And generally only one sample is taken. If the sample is taken randomly, the sample characteristics will imperfectly mimic the population characteristics. And again, by randomly, you could think of at this point, if you could enumerate every person or every subject in the population, put all their names into a hat or a computer and shake it up and pull out the number you needed for your study, that would be the idea of getting a random sample. And ostensibly, a random sample is one that's imperfect because it doesn't include everyone in the population, but is nevertheless representative of that population. So again, if a sample is taken randomly, the sample characteristics will imperfectly mimic the population characteristics. And we've already said that the sample mean is our best guess for the population mean. The sample median is our best guess from a sample for the population median, etc. But also, as it turns out, another statistic we generate from a sample is actually our sample distribution. That is our best guess based on our sample of data as to what the distribution of all data values looks like in the population we cannot observe. So, for example, here is that histogram of blood pressure values for a random sample of 113 men that we looked at previously. And here, the bin width is one millimeter mercury, which we said was a little bit too fine for this data, but I'm going to do this so just so we can compare it to some other pictures with the same setting. Let's suppose I went back and took a random sample of 500 men and did a histogram of those values. How would that compare to the smaller sample? Well, this is the result of a simulation doing just that. The general shape is similar. I think we could have gone with the notion that the sample of 113 men had somewhat of a symmetric distribution that maybe had a bell-like quality, but it was kind of crude. And here with a sample of 500 men, we see that a little more explicitly defined. The peaks aren't as high, and we filled in some of the gaps, but the general shape of the data is similar to that from that smaller sample of 113 men, and the range is similar, albeit a little bit wider, because we are taking a bigger sample and tend to get more extremes, as we talked about previously. And then finally, suppose I was privy to the population of all men, and I did a histogram of those values. Well, this is what I might get here. It's less crude than the other two pictures, but has exhibits the same general characteristics that they hinted at. Symmetry, bell-shapedness, etc. And I'm kind of going backwards here to highlight the idea that when we take a random sample, whether it be 100 persons, 50 persons, 500 persons, if it is representative, which it should be if randomly selected, then the data distribution of values in our sample will be a crude facsimile of what's going on in the population. The more data we have for our sample, the better we'll flesh out the picture, but we're not going to change the general characteristics of the distribution. Whether I was looking at 113 men or 500 men, I saw something reasonably symmetric and bell-shaped with similar ranges. So what we just looked at in the previous slide was what I'd call the probability density. It's a smooth, idealized curve that shows the shape of the distribution in a population. We're never going to see this. This is a theoretical construct. We can only estimate it from the distribution presented by a representative sample from that population. Areas of the curve of this probability density represent the percent of the population in any given interval. And we can, of course, estimate those by taking the comparable areas under the sample distribution curves. The distributions, again, that we saw for blood pressure were indicative of a symmetric bell-shaped distribution for all blood pressure measures in men. So if I were a researcher and only had one sample, the sample of 113 men, and I did the histogram, that histogram of those 113 sample values would be my best estimate for the true population distribution in terms of the mean, median, SD, and shape.
Now let's take a look at another distribution we've worked with, the hospital length of stay data. Suppose we looked at a histogram of length of stay values for 100 patients discharged in a single year from an academic teaching hospital in our samples representative. And here's that distribution in histogram form. And you can see very quickly that the distribution of these 100 points does not look anything like the distribution of blood pressures. It's not symmetric, it's not relatively bell-shaped, and there's a long right tail. Suppose we were to take another random sample with 500 patients and do a histogram of that. Well, what we get is a more fleshed-out picture looking less crude than the one for 100 patients but having the same general characteristics. And you can see that's what we have here. Similar to that other sample of 100 patients, we see something that is certainly not symmetric or bell-shaped and has a long right tail as well. And finally, if we were to actually get our hands on the population distribution, the length of stay for all patients discharged in the same year from that teaching hospital, what we'd see is a finer version of what we saw in those two subsample histograms. So again, the point is, if we take a representative sample, then not only are the mean, median, and SDs from the sample the best guess for their population counterparts, but the sample distribution is also a statistic based on our sample that imparts information about what's going on in the population. And the only thing I'll get in terms of changing distributions when I take larger sample sizes is that I'll just get a clearer picture the larger my sample size because I'll be filling in more of the points. But I won't be systematically changing the shape of that. So if the population from which I'm sampling has a very non-symmetric distribution of values, then any sample I take, regardless of size, should demonstrate that when I do a histogram. Here are some common shapes of distributions that you may encounter. Symmetric and bell-shaped, as we talked about, sometimes called normal-esque, and we'll discuss the normal curve in the next lecture. Something like we saw with the blood pressure values. Here's something like we saw with the length of stay values, sometimes called positively skewed or skewed to the right. The idea is that there's a tail in the distribution, and it's because their extremes are larger in value than the other values, so they tend to pull that curve out in a positive direction, which on a real number line is the right. The opposite of that is something called negatively skewed or skewed to the left, in which the extremes are smaller values than the rest of the set of values, and so the tail is pulling in the negative direction. Some other types of distributions that sometimes pop up are bimodal distributions, those with multiple humps on them, something called the reverse J shape, believe it or not, which is sort of like a right-skewed distribution, except it has no bump on the left-hand side. It's a completely decreasing distribution, and a uniform distribution in which all values have similar proportions in the sample or population of interest. Some characteristics of the distribution, you can think of some of the things we've studied as describing different pieces of a distribution. A mode, something we haven't formally defined until now, is the highest point on the distribution, the most frequently occurring value or set of values in a distribution. The median, which we've seen is right in the middle, is, is the equal areas point. The median would be the point under any curve that broke the curve up into two equally area shaded parts. And the mean is where you could balance the distribution on your finger. Symmetric distributions tend to have means, medians, and modes that are similar, and if it's truly symmetric, that all three are equal to each other. Right skewed distributions or positively skewed have a long right tail, and since the extreme values are larger than the rest of the other values, it pulls up the mean, but because the median is more robust and resistant to those extreme values, the median stays rather stable, even with the increasing values in the right tail, so the mean tends to be greater than the median. In a left skewed distribution, it's the opposite. The longer left tail, the extreme values are lesser in value than those in the rest of the distribution, which brings the mean down relative to the median. So in our next set of lectures, we'll discuss in more detail some properties of a specific and famous symmetric bell-shaped distribution, the normal curve.